Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ episode number 94. This is the Knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. And this week we're talking about the Blade Tech Tech Lock, ubiquitous accessory. What tools do you wish that Victorinox would put on a Swiss Army knife? And we're going to talk about blood grooves, which promises to be one of the fuller conversations we've ever had here. Let's get into it. <laughs> I see what you did there. Well, good. But anyways, welcome. <laughs> do, do, do. Ta -da. All right. Well, welcome to the episode. If you are new to this series, the deal is I go through the comments section below these videos and pick out some of the questions that you folks leave there to feature in a future episode. So if you want a chance for your question to make it in, just leave it in the comments below this video. All right, first question today comes from D. Anderson, 1922-30. Is that your second account? No, I spelled it S-O-N. Oh. Dirty Swedes. I love the Swedes, don't, don't take anything. Taking that out of context. <laughs> The question is, so I am new to knives. That's not a question. Oh, here we go. What is the deal with blood grooves? And is that even what they are called? So yes, let's get into it. Let's make some people mad because, well, I'll hold up a knife right here. The Mark II fighter, the USMC fighter from K-Bar or the K-Bar knife. It has this feature that you're talking about right here. And the whole idea behind blood grooves quote unquote, is that they're supposed to, you know, when they're, it's a combat knife feature, so pardon uh, things being maybe a little graphic here, uh, when they are inside of a target, it's supposed to kind of relieve some hydrostatic pressure, allow for exsanguination or for retraction from said target. Um, but, and I am gonna pick on K-Bar right here because they have used this term in their marketing, however, that is not what this feature is. A blood groove is an imagined thing. I'm sorry. Uh, and I know I'm going to make some folks, uh, get some folks up in arms over that, get people's blood flowing, so, so to speak. But this is a fuller. That is what this feature is called. It is not a blood groove. And the purpose behind it has nothing to do with liquid flowing through it, liquid properties, relieving, you know, suction, anything like that. Put simply, a fuller is designed to remove weight from a blade without compromising the strength. Think of it like, you know, an I-beam type of construction, just on a knife blade instead. And that allows, you, you would see it really commonly on medieval swords, for example, from the uh, European tradition. You could have a longer blade that wasn't as heavy, you could control the balance a bit better. Uh, you could also preserve material, you could have that longer blade without using as much steel, which of course steel was, you know, at a much bigger premium than it is today. So those were, you know, that's the primary purpose of, traditionally anyway, a fuller. That's what it does. Interestingly, we call that feature a fuller and it is made traditionally blacksmithing style speaking with a fuller. Fuller makes a fuller. <laughs> So what it is, you know, you've got the anvil and you've got the, uh, and I'm forgetting the, uh, the term for it, but the little keyholes that you can put different forms, drifts and swages, that sort of thing into. And you would essentially have a hardened piece of rounded steel, rounded material that would go in there. You'd lay the blade flat on there, hammer it, and you'd create that shape. You would use that fuller to fuller the metal. It was the act of fullering by using that, uh, that device, which then lent itself, lent its name to the result as well. Interesting bit of side history. Um, in terms of usage today, certainly on, on fixed blades, that balance issue is, you know, it is part of the equation. Also, they look cool. You know, let's be honest, they certainly do look nice. And, you know, some people do like to learn, lean into the, uh, the you know, more gory aspects of the, uh, the marketing side of that thing. But again, I'm more for uh, actual fact than fantastical details anyway. So you can still get the, the lightning without, you know, compromising strength, that sort of thing. But interestingly, I think 
even mo like more common on newer designs today is you see it a lot on folding knives, which shouldn't necessarily, or let me phrase that differently, won't benefit as much as a longer fixed blade or sword from the process because it's smaller, lighter blade to begin with. But here are three knives right here. We've got the Civivi Bull Mastiff, we have the Artisan Cutlery Wren, and the MKM Colvera. Each very cool knives. Actually, let's start with the MKM because this fuller looks good, but it also serves a few practical purposes that have nothing to do with traditional fullering, so to speak. This is a flipper knife right here. You can see, flips open, but this is a removable flipper tab. So when you take that out, you're left with out an obvious opening method and that's where the fuller comes in. Fullers on modern pocket knives typically are more often, besides having a cool look, functionally provide some opening methods. For instance, makes it very easy to open two-handed. You can kind of think of it like a long pull on a traditional slip joint. Actually, eh, most of those are kind of like milled out and uh, sort of faceted as opposed to a, a rounded fuller shape. So I'd, I wouldn't call those a fuller necessarily. Still groovy. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm surprised it took me that long to come up with that one. I have no rejoinder because it's, I, I want to hate you for that, that joke, but it's kind of perfect. <sighs> Dang, thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Back to the MKM. So you can think of it as a, a nice pinch point for two-handed opening, because you have a pretty strong detent on this knife, so that aids getting past it. You can also use it as a one-hand opener, although more, shall we say, attuned to that type of opening is the, uh, the broader fuller you might see on this Bull Mastiff, because started in the wrong position there a little bit, but you can see that easy thumb opening without any other kind of thumb stud or anything like that. It also provides a way for everyone's kind of favorite trendy opening mechanism or method nowadays, the reverse flick using your middle finger, you can flick that blade open. So that's a, that's a practical purpose you would see towards a fuller these days. And yes, even though it, you know, there's no end, you don't see the terminus of the fuller near the point like you do on the, uh, the K bar here, it goes beyond the edge of the blade. Yes, that would, still be called a fuller in this case. So hope that helps and hope we can all stop saying blood groove one of these days. It's probably never gonna happen because it's just like something that people latch onto and is like cool, quote unquote, but it's a crusade I'll never win. Oh well. Um, but actually the reason that I think that's important is because it does have no actual bearing on what the, the actual point of said feature is, and it just creates this unnecessary stigma that is one more thing we have to kind of combat. And who needs that? Nobody's got time for more of that. Next question comes from Ian's clone. First of all, I want to know what'd you do with the original? Hopefully he's Ian's okay out there. Uh, what would it take to convince Victorinox to make an outdoorsy model with a dedicated ferro rod striker tool? I don't want to use other tools as, as a striker to a degree that hinders their primary purpose. Just curious if there could be enough of a demand and if this is a realistic effort without modding my own SAK, Swiss Army knife. Thanks, sure thing. Personally, I don't, I see where you're coming from um, because a couple of the things that if you don't have a striker you could use on an outdoorsy model like this Farmer X right here, Knife Center exclusive red Alox by the way, the things that are crisp enough on this are the knife blade itself. And you know, you do that, you're gonna be destroying that edge to get your spark. If that's all you have and it's a survival scenario, do it because you, know, you might need that fire. The awl here or punch on the other side also has a nice crisp edge for striking. But I can understand absolutely not wanting to use those because it would come at the expense of the primary purpose of those tools. However, the reason I personally don't think we'll ever see a dedicated striker tool, and also don't think we actually need one, is because of the saw that if you're carrying an outdoorsy multi-tool from Victorinox, it probably has a saw on it or should have a saw on it anyway, I would recommend. 
but not from the teeth edge here. The spine of these saw blades are actually crisp enough to throw a spark. And the way to do it safely, because you wouldn't wanna necessarily be bearing down, you know, holding the rod here and scraping forward with the saw in a reverse grip, that could end in some pretty, uh, pretty ugly results. Whether you're using a full-size ferro rod or, for instance, the, uh, the Fire Ant accessories that Victorinox themselves make. Maybe we have to speed up this footage because this is sticking on me. But the way to do this safely is you take your rod, again, whether it's the tiny one like this or a full-size one, lay your tinder down on you know, whatever surface you're working on, lay your saw over it so it holds the tinder in place and then you're gonna drag backwards, drag your rod backwards across that spine to throw the spark forward. Very easy to use, pretty safe if you know what you're doing and you know, execute that safely. And yeah, you're gonna be, uh, you'll, you'll kinda muck up the back edge of that saw blade a little bit, but it's not gonna affect its primary purpose one bit. So that's what I would recommend trying if you haven't already. Hope that helps. All right, next question comes from Skypilot409. Uh, one thing I'd love for you to do is a video on these things you call tech locks. Uh, my ignorance is showing, but I'm not too proud to say that I know nothing about them. No worries. Uh, how they work, how to fasten them to a sheath, ways to fasten them sizes. You get the picture, I'm sure. Thanks in advance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, on our, our new Knives of the Week videos, especially when I'm talking about fixed blades, you'll often hear me mention the tech lock and whether a sheath is compatible with it or not. And the reason for that is it's, and I, and I don't know how initially it, it came to be this, but it's kind of a standard that works, you know, aftermarket accessory wise. Here is a tech lock in all its glory. It is made by Blade Tech. It is spelled T-E-K-L-O-K, which makes it difficult to find in search engines sometimes, but you can find it on our site like that. And the idea behind this, it was to, prov to provide a modular clip that had a secondary locking mechanism on it so that you could have options and security in how you attach aftermarket or other sheaths to your belt. Whether it's a knife, other tool, whatever, what you've got here is well, I'll talk about the whole pattern in a second. You've got on the backside here, it is curved a little bit to hug against your body a little bit extra. And to unlock it, you have to pull this little tab down, this little like fanged lever, so to speak, then squeeze in on these wings to open it. Fairly involved set of motions and it's very, very unlikely for it to just happen. So you're very, very unlikely to have your sheath come loose from your belt. Opening it up, you have these two tabs or two bars that can be adjusted, so you can adjust this to your belt size. And then you've got a three by three grid of holes on the back side here, or technically front side, that are, you know, it's, it forms a square, so the spacing between all of these holes is, is the same. Not on a diagonal, mind you, but you know, perpendicular and parallel lines, same spacing. And their hardware comes uh, with the tech lock to be able to attach it to you know, a given sheath. So you shouldn't have to worry about you know, excess hardware if you don't want to, but if you do, real, real easy to take this to a hardware store and find some stuff that would fit. So let's take this knife for example. This is the Chico Diablo X from Double Star. Really cool everyday and outdoor pattern. Good camp knife, good hunter. Especially with those bright scales, really easy to see but we've got a Kydex sheath here and you have a hole spacing that is tech lock compatible. You can see we have three rivets here and three rivets along the bottom, both which fit this standardized spacing. Sometimes you may see some sheaths that rather than a hole in the middle, they might have a slot. That can be cool because it makes it a little easier to use other sized aftermarket accessories with since it's you know, a little more modular. Uh, you might see longer slots here too. No, uh, no worries there. You would use your tech lock with one hole in the hole and one hole in the slot, no worries. But the cool thing, let me open this back up here to demonstrate. Because it's the same distance either way, you can carry this horizontally or you know vertically right there. This one you see you've got all three holes lined up. If you wanted to ride a little bit higher because you've got three holes on this particular sheath, you can goose that up a little bit and just use two 
Typically you would just be using two attachment points anyway. You could, so you could do that way. You could also flip it and carry it horizontal, whether you're lining up with the holes on the bottom or the top in this case. So it's pretty cool. Very easy to use once you uh, get the hang of it. it, makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's uh, another size, there's a small tech lock here, which I have as well. It lacks, however, that, uh, that secondary safety mechanism, but it still has the squeeze to open uh, that I mentioned before. So still very unlikely for it to come loose. And it's the same concept, but is a tighter hole spacing. And that's why I'll usually say whether it's compatible with a large or a small tech lock when I'm showing things. So that's pretty neat. Interestingly, so that, that does allow you to you know, have a more compact package, especially useful on some smaller knives. But interestingly, check out the names on the back of this tech lock or front of this tech lock right here. We've got Tim Wegner and Robert Terzola, Bob T, Bob Terzola, the knife designer who in partnership with Civivi has actually kind of taken this concept one step further with the T-clip right here. Like the small tech lock, it lacks and after, or it lacks the little uh, secondary locking, but again, you still have to do that deliberate squeeze, so still very unlikely to accidentally come loose. You have a sliding bar here for your size adjustment, so it's more minutely adjustable, and they've replaced one of the uh, holes on each side, the middle hole, with a slot. So even if your sheath is not technically tech lock compatible with the T-clip, it you might be able to then use it. And all of these are really expensive. Obviously the Civivi is uh, imported. This is made in China. It's like five or six bucks, maybe seven nowadays. Uh, the Blade Tech models are made in the USA and they're about 15 bucks. So still quite affordable. And it's gonna allow you a lot of different options to carry the blade exactly how you wish. All right, now we come to the lightning round for today. First is from Michael Niedorf. Uh, he says, I do, it's not a question. It's a statement, but he says, I do not like the looks of the Ontario rat and I don't know why anyone would buy one. That's funny. I get it. <laughs> you know, in the words of Han Solo re regarding his uh, Millennium Falcon, it may not look like much, but it's got it where it counts. And sometimes kind of the homeliest knives out there are the most hardworking. And the Ontario rat really has earned its reputation as a hardworking, rugged knife that works well and is quite a bargain. I mean, for a bit over 30 bucks, you get the uh, get into the base models and the most expensive ones come in at about 50 with these uh, this Micarta and D2 version, which is the Knife Center exclusive. So I get it, but put it to use and it may change your mind. And it's changed a lot of minds over the years. And that's why people do still buy them, despite its homely good looks. All right, Toby Hall says, Hey DCA, what is an inexpensive knife to experience a convex grind? I've got one for you right here. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about a fixed blade. You better be because that's the, uh, the inexpensive way to get one. Check out the Real Steel Bushcraft 3. There's a few knives in this series that are convex ground. Make sure to check uh, the listing to make sure you're buying one of the convex ones. It's like just over $70 for this. So not cheap, but fairly, Fairly reasonable, I'd say, especially for what you're getting. A very comfortable knife, D2 blade about four inches with that convex grind. The cool thing about experiencing a convex, they're very easy to sharpen with sandpaper and strop. And something it's very hard to do with any other type of grind out there, not impossible, but by far easiest with a convex is you can use the shoulders of that apple seed shaped geometry to hold the sharpened edge at exactly the elevation you want as you're skimming over a project. Pretty cool. Once you find utility for that, it can become very addicting. I have to, to speak from experience right there. So check out that series right there. Which brings us to our final question for today, our most serious question, which comes from Ralph Riley. Cutting through the chatter, which edge is best for that? I'd say what you want is something that's bold and straight to the point, like this knife right here. Thomas, what's that blade shape? Yeah. But anyway, it's the edge itself. Bold, straight to the point. Yeah, technically there's a tiny little bit of a, tiny little bit of curvature to this edge, but I still had to use this knife as the example because this is the Kaiser Converse. 
when you're talking about chatter. So, hope that helps. Definitely wouldn't have been the banter. Nah. Now I feel like I've, it's a missed opportunity. Oh well. Well, image. Bing, bing. But that's all the questions we've got for today. No, because the banter would be encouraging yeah, chatter. Yeah, so it wouldn't be the banter. Yeah. I, I, I figured that, you saw me figure that joke out in real time now. I, just, I wasn't there with Thomas this time. So you, he used to talk and he forgot how to listen. That's accusatory, good sir. J'accuse. <laughs> Je t'aime. Anyway, that's all the questions we have for today. Leave your questions down in the comments below for a chance to have it featured in a future episode. If you wanna get your hands on any of these knives right here, check out the links in the description. They'll take you over to knifecenter.com. And don't forget, we've got our knife rewards program, which means as long as you're putting your money down on one of these knives, you're gonna be earning some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. That's Thomas behind the camera. He's going into timeout after this, I promise. We're signing off. See you next time. Uh, you're not fun anymore. <laughs>